We've got uh, an hour scheduled. What we wish to do is present for at least the first half hour or so um, information, some insights, and try to explain a topic that's a mile wide and a mile deep. This is not an easy discussion because there's so many moving parts here, but we will leave plenty of time for questions and discussions amongst us. So let's get started. This, I, I looked at this and said, well, what right now, probably more than anything else, is in our lives and affecting what we see and what we do on a daily basis? And of course, inflation. There isn't anything that isn't happening right now that we're not being affected by inflation and its repercussions. So <clears throat> as we're going through this, I would like you just to think personally, what in your daily life have you noticed that's changed in terms of going to the gas pumps, food cost, anything and everything associated with the rise in various types of commodities and what those implications may be. So our discussion is gonna have a couple of components to it. One of course is the title, tip of the iceberg, US-China competition, pushing inflation. So that will be a primary focus in addition to helping you understand what are the various forces that have come together to really provide kind of a unique situation that right now is kind of that perfect storm. Driving a combination of US-China competition, coming out of COVID and a series of other events that really right at the moment is not unique in terms of the history of what we've experienced economically, but for us at this time is different than what we've seen over the last really 12 to 13 years. So coming out of 2008, we've experienced very muted inflation, extremely low interest rates and an ever soaring stock market. Seems to be changing right now. Something feels different. A caveat, we will do our best to give you our best insights and information as we understand it today. We'll also give you what could be a continuing trend and what its implications may be. There's no guarantee that what we say will come to pass. One thing about economic forecasting is generally it's wrong. Now, why? Mm, that's a question for the ages. We do our best though. And I think part of it is the world can change very rapidly and does change very quickly. Circumstances as we understand it at this moment may be very different six months a year or so from now. But the trends that we see at this time are what we will be discussing today. So let's, let's look at this and think about 2008 was a truly catastrophic economic meltdown didn't just affect us here in the US, but affected the entire global economic populations. 2008, we get by that, clean some things up, we get the banking system back to a healthier situation. We put the type of regulations in place that probably needed to be there prior to 2008, but a crisis only comes about because you don't do these things. Hence, you have a crisis. So as we're having this discussion, think that this is also a very normal part of human behavior. As Churchill said, you could, you could always count on the United States to do the right thing after it's exhausted every other option. And it's a truism of human behavior. So as much as we have the technical components, the ability to understand and dis disseminate information, human behavior is as important in this discussion as anything else. So 2008 passes, we take on tremendous amounts of debt here and abroad. Countries are reconstituting itself getting back on track again. So just when our world is starting to get back to some degree of normalcy and predictability, what happens? COVID, the predictable, unpredictable event. What do I mean by that? Anybody who is in the public health realm has been warning us for decades that the inevitability of a pandemic was only a matter of time, not if it was gonna happen, but when it was gonna happen. So of course, did we do what we needed to, to prepare, to assess our infrastructure vulnerability, our healthcare system, our ability to disseminate information from a public health perspective to you and I, both here and abroad, different countries were prepared to different degrees. But it's probably fair to say 
that we were, for the most part, left scrambling in face of COVID. So as we're just starting to get back to some normalcy, here comes COVID. What we had known before and what we're dealing with now, to some degree was predictable, but we were not quite ready. And now we're dealing with the aftermath. So what are the implications of that? We've gone through a low inflationary period. Commodity prices in terms of oil have been up at one point over hundred bucks a barrel, came way down to the twenties, kind of settled in the forties. We're kind of in the upper seventies, 80 bucks a barrel right now. But what happened is it put us in a place where everything that we had come to expect was turned upside down. As a result of that, we're seeing what's taking place right now. Anybody looking off the coast of California and Long Beach sees about 80 to 100 different container ships sitting off port. They cannot dock because the facilities to unload all those goods and supplies are either labor shortages or the equipment is not in a place to be able to do this in a seamless fashion that we simply become used to. So we're seeing the disruption of goods and supplies. That's part of the equation. But there's a bigger picture here. And the picture is this. US population is growing as several other parts of the world. We're expected to hit over nine to 10 billion people by 2050. So we have external issues here that are as much at play as what we are seeing right now that are gonna to continue to be a issue and a opportunity. The duality always does exist. So we're seeing growing populations, but what's the real key? Where are these populations growing? Mostly in emerging economies. China has 1.4 billion people. India is slightly behind, but is expected to exceed China. China is actually getting older. Kind of an interesting little fact that most people aren't fully aware of is that China is an aging population, which creates its own issues and problems. So we have these dynamics that are not going away. We are in this unique moment in time where there are external forces that are going to continue to affect issues such as inflation, commodities, supply and demand, economic cooperation or lack of. So in addition to growing populations, what the real key is, these are places that have not yet, but are moving in the direction of participating in a lifestyle that we've enjoyed here for decades. So what does it really mean? It's consumption. It's the consumption of goods and services. I don't know how often do we ever stop to think about the world around us as it exists right here in the US. The ease of which we can get whatever we wish to within reason. The ability to consume at a level, we represent about 20% of the world's GDP, gross domestic product, and yet we have about 5% of the world's population. So we're doing a pretty good job on the consumption side. So in the developing world, you have countries in the EU, the US, Australia, I'd even almost put China in that category right now. We are not yet maxing out our population growth, but in some cases, we're actually seeing that population growth slow. So what's occurring in the developing countries is they are moving from a low consumption rate to a middle class. India has a population that right now in the middle class is about the size of the entire US's population. What do you think their desires are gonna be? Are they gonna ask for less? Do they want fewer TVs, refrigerators, stereos, automobiles, vacations, travel, everything that we understand and enjoy, others are gonna want and ask for the same thing. So what does that mean? Especially when you're thinking about commodities. Are they gonna be demanding less in terms of extraction industries or more? And I think the answer is pretty clear, it's gonna be more. So we're in a cycle where over the next couple of decades, it's not gonna decline, it's only gonna increase. This is gonna put pressure in all aspects of what we need in order to maintain these lifestyles. The other part of the equation is we're kind of in a unique situation where the tensions between traditional fossil fuel extraction, oil, gas, coal, the, 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 the ones that we've come to understand and depend on are in tension right now, of course, with the move towards renewable energy. So we have these two factions, growing populations, emerging middle classes, more consumption, and at the same time, 
we're trying to transition because of the issues associated with climate change into a renewable type of carbon-free environment. Anybody here doubt that this is, going to be, this is going to be an easy, smooth transition? No, you got the political, you have the social, you have the economic. And Rob will give you some examples exactly of what's happened even just recently in terms of certain countries that understand they, knew to, they need to move away from coal, but what are they doing right now? They're consuming more coal, China in this case and very specific to economic reasons why they're doing so. It's not that they don't understand the implications of the pollution issues you're dealing with. It's just at times the economic reality is more striking and demanding than some of the longer term implications. So these are always the tensions that are at work right now. And some of these tensions come into play because if you're going to move towards a more renewable economy, you may for a period of time see even more extraction of resources, not less. I was looking at some charts that were provided by an associate of ours, and I thank you very much for that, that showed where we are right now in terms of renewables, in terms of electric production, and your traditional. So the ratios right now are about 20% of the electric generation globally comes from renewables, hydro solar, wind, that's an increase, pretty dramatic. Prices have come way down for the, product, for, excuse me, for the production and cost of using these types of renewables. That's a great trend, we wanna see this. But if we go out to 2050, that trend is still growing, but the estimates, and again, these are estimates, and we could see some breakthroughs that can change this dramatically, is expected to be about 42%. That's a great increase. It's moving in the right direction, which means you're still getting a substantial amount of your electric generation from traditional types of fossil fuels. So that tension is going to continue to exist. And where the tension comes into play in terms of US and China, we're the two largest economies in the world by far. Number three, Japan, correct? Followed by Germany, Great Britain, and India. So while they represent almost 40%, the next largest, I believe, in terms of Japan, is about 4.3. So it just gives you some perspective of how dynamic the relationship has and will continue to be between China and the US and what those tensions are. And how does that fit into driving the inflation cycle? How does that fit into the demand for commodities or access to? One of China's biggest concerns, which sometimes we don't think about, is stability internally. They've got a number of issues to deal with, but when you have 1.4 billion people, the potential for internal issues and conflict is substantial. You and I don't hear often about this because we don't access the information. There's protests on a daily basis that take place across that country over a number of different issues. Interestingly, China is dealing with something very similar to the U.S. right now, income disparity. Regulatory, if I close my eyes and heard about what China's doing in terms of regulatory with some of their major tech companies, and then I had somebody tell me about what's happening here in the US, they could be interchangeable. I mean, who's been up in front of Congress on several different occasions recently? Facebook, Facebook changed its name. Meta, what, uh, Rob, is it Meta? Meta Platforms. Meta Platforms. So if you don't like me as Facebook, Facebook, I change my name and I'm somebody new. I recreate myself, that's business. So the issues that we see right here are not dissimilar to what China has to deal with. Jobs, quality of life, educational opportunities, and of course, where it sees itself in terms of its role in the world. So as we hear headlines, what I ask us to do sometimes is think beyond the headlines and realize that often the headlines are just exactly that. It's sexy, it's glitzy. It's 24 seven cable. We need to have something constantly being put out there, but does it really reflect what those tensions are? And I can make a case that yes, the tensions are real. Somebody just the other day said, well, I don't see a war between the US and China over Taiwan immediately, but possibly within the next 18 to 24 months. What kind of statement is that? What does that tell you? What's the expectation? Now, one of the tensions, of course, is access to resources. So for a moment, put aside the nationalistic interests that Taiwan and China are the same people. And China has been clear from the beginning 
that they have an expectation, especially under this leadership of a reunification, how that will look yet to be determined. But what does Taiwan have that is a part of every aspect of our lives? What do they make? Chips, not potato chips, but the chips that go into every phone, automobile, refrigerator, you name it, when you start thinking about it. About 20% of the global chip production comes out of Taiwan. China is not dependent on Taiwan for chips, but it's not an insignificant amount. Just as we are not self-sufficient, but are working towards that. So the interdependencies are much greater than maybe some of what the issues are. But the tensions in terms of trade agreements, global warming, there's two countries that are missing right now from the conference in Scotland. That's Russia and China. We need their cooperation as they need ours, especially on some of these bigger issues. Cybersecurity, terrorism, trade agreements. So you go down the list, there's a lot of work yet to be done. So these tensions between us and China sometimes are a bit overstated when you actually do kind of a look underneath the hood to see where the areas of cooperation are. You may be surprised at how in the private sector, there's a great deal of cooperation and exchange of economic ideas and technology between US and China. Businesses that are located in China that have now locations here in the US, vice versa. Major US financial firms have made a point of locating in China, understanding what that market represents and what that future can be. But we still have, who's gonna be the leader? Where do we give up some of our sovereignty from the standpoint of treaties and different trade agreements? Trans-Pacific Pact was something that the Obama administration had put in place so that they recognized that the Asian markets in the Asian region was the 21st century of where the US needed to put military as well as economic resources. Change of administration and the pack gets put to the side. So what does that do? It leaves a void. Who steps in? China. China starts developing relations with several of the countries in the region that we would have been in a agreement with. So these are constantly never ending and moving tensions that exist. What I want you to remember from this as I'm gonna introduce Rob here to talk about where these tensions may arise from the standpoint of inflation, a commodity super cycle and what the implications are, are such that the more you take time to educate yourself, step away from the headlines of 24 seven cable, talk to people in expertise like Dr. Key and others, seek out information from diverse sources, assume what you know is only a fraction of what you still need to know. That'll help open up your abilities and your critical thinking so that when you are in a conversation or you're looking at something, you have a little bit different perspective. So with China and the US, number of different issues that will continue to be problematic going forward. It's not a unipolar world anymore. And what I mean by that, after World War II, basically the US stood on top of the heap. Russia with its ability in terms of nuclear capabilities becomes our competition. Russia economically is almost, but not quite an emerging economy. They still have substantial leadership in certain research and areas, but they have fallen to the wayside in many other areas economically. But it's not just even the US and China, you've got the EU, which is a significant economic block. You do have Russia and you have other countries now that are part of the equation in the Middle East that need and have to be paid attention to. So it's gonna get more complicated, not less. So Rob, at this point, I want you to please come up, give us some of this perspective in terms of what's happening from a inflation standpoint, because this is where kind of the rubber meets the road. Yep. How does this affect your life? So, uh, thanks Bob. Yep. Okay, just making sure this is you know, to use this. So let's talk about inflation first off, like what, what it means when we say inflation. So in general, the idea is that when you're in an inflationary environment, prices are going up and you expect that prices will be higher in the future. 
Uh, but there's a little more to that too, in that not only are prices going up, um, but wages are not keeping up fast enough to uh, offset, right? So you're actually losing purchasing power. So when the, that's sort of the biggest issue with inflation when we talk about inflation is that expectations are that in the future, you will be able to purchase less uh, than you can right now. So obviously that's a concern for just about anybody, right? Like we're all, we're, we all expect that um, as our careers progress or just in general that we'll acquire more wealth or be in a better financial position, but inflation has the ability to take that away, right? That, that you, you can't buy as much, you can't get what you're looking for. Um, and I think also what we want to talk about is what we mean when we talk about a super cycle. So what does it mean that there's this, this talk or chat about a, com a coming commodities super cycle? So commodities or sort of the basic um, raw goods, right? When we talk commodities, we're talking about oil, natural gas, coal, lumber, wheat, corn, kind of all that stuff. Um, you know, if you're a fan of 80s movies, orange juice futures or mm -hmm. uh, pork belly futures. Trading places. Those, yeah, I don't even think those uh, pork bellies don't even trade anymore, I don't think. But anyways, so those typically trade in a what we would call a cyclical manner, right? So they go through periods of uh, a bull market where prices are increasing and uh, periods of a bear market where prices are going down. And that's kind of overall driven by uh, one of the kind of fundamental factors of economics, supply and demand. You have periods where, you know, oh, we've got a great wheat crop this year. We've got more wheat than in the previous year and it exceeds demand. That means prices are going to go down. And this year, particularly, we had a particularly hot and dry summer. There's less wheat. Um, prices go up. Um, so that's kind of typically how commodities markets work is they have these kind of short bull and bear cycles that just kind of repeat. Uh, a super cycle is different because now you're talking about some sort of secular uh, change that's going to drive uh, a bull market over a longer period of time. Typically, when we talk super cycle, we're talking uh, a decade minimum, right? So, so currently, I think it was four or five identified super cycles over the last hundred or so years. The first one starting sort of in the late 1800s, coinciding with industrialization of the Western world, and then driving into World War I. You have uh, sort of a, a dip after that as the world uh, sort of recovers, and then it starts to ramp up again as a result of World War II. Um, and then, you know, kind of post that, you have another super cycle starting in the, you know, from this chart here, early 60s, really starts to ramp in the 70s. Um, and then another one over the last, you know, kind of 20 or 30 years, it's really represented by kind of China's entrance into the World Trade Organization or an industrialization in China. Sort of ended at the, in 2008 with the global financial crisis and has just kind of been like simmering along since then. So there, are, so the question now is, you know, are we starting another one of these cycles? And what are some of the factors that could drive that? Oops, wrong way. So one of the things that Bob talked about is increasing population, specifically an increasing middle class in the global population centers of China and India. I think you, you made a great kind of point, kind of drawing that out that, you know, you have more and more people that are looking to improve their quality of life with better goods and services, that is a, an immense demand on resources, right? So you got to have the resources uh, available to sort of meet those demands from mm -hmm. a food, you know, they want better food, they want better entertainment, they want better housing. All of those require commodity inputs to, to make happen. Um, energy. Um, is kind of an, another interesting thing that Bob talked about, right? Like energy prices are something that we've seen sort of um, post 2008 or, or actually really since like the kind of shale boom in the mid 20 teens, 
um, prices have been like fairly muted on oil. Gas prices have not been uh, terrible the last five or so yeah. years. And, and as you can see, that's because we had this big ramp in investment into more oil and gas inventory, right? So we just we figured out better ways of getting oil and gas out of the ground, uh, which brought in much more supply, which drove the price down and made gas and made gasoline for our cars, natural gas for houses, much more affordable. Uh, however, uh, this also drove oil prices down, right? Which is if you're an oil company makes for not great returns if the price per barrel or price per um, liter of uh, natural gas is, is below your um, sort of extraction costs. Uh, and so you, we're not seeing as much investment in uh, the ability to pull oil and gas out of the ground over the last couple of years uh, for a number of reasons, right? So the fact that we plowed, there was so much investment in the space over like the kind of 20 teens time period. Um, and it was done at an economically unfeasible oil, long-term unfeasible oil and gas prices means that there are a lot of investors that are underwater on those investments, right? So they're going to wait to put more money into bringing more rigs uh, to drill oil until those stock prices of e &P stocks go up and they start to earn a better return. So combine that with uh, COVID, right? Where you have fields shutting down, you have industrial production um, being impacted, and you, you know, just kind of creates this pretty complex a scenario where we now have, uh, you know, multi-year high oil and natural gas prices, but really interesting considering, you know, what was it in, in uh, May of 2020? Oil futures briefly hit negative numbers, uh, meaning like you could not, you would have to, if you had barrels of oil, you would have to pay somebody else to take them from you, which is pretty incredible. Rob, I wanted to make the point because this is very instructive in terms of understanding markets too. I mentioned about that tension between traditional fossil fuels and this transi transition to renewables. Yeah. What, what we've seen happen is <clears throat> major oil companies, they're not investing for a project that they're gonna even start extracting oil often 10 years down the road. Billions of dollars it takes to invest in a field for future production. Recently, Exxon announced a cutback in terms of some of its capital expenditures because of what it believes will be possibly politically as well as economic demands that will reduce oil. So we could see this interesting transition to renewables that is taking place. And people would say, well, if we're using, we're not gonna use as much oil, then why are prices at hundred bucks a barrel or 120 yeah. or higher? So I'm just giving you a heads up now that the possibility that you could see much higher oil even in the face of declining future oil production as more renewable is coming online, do not be surprised because that's how the markets react. Because as long as supply demand is not just falling off or the renewables are increasing rather dramatically to replace that, i.e. electric cars. Yeah, I think one of the things that was great is that, that demand is still there. Now. Exactly. So in, in, in these kind of cycles, right, like oil price the, you know, can fluctuate pretty dramatically in the short term. Um, right, like yeah, over the last year and a half, you go from a negative to now a you know hundred dollar a barrel approximate swing in the mm -hmm. last year and a half, which yep. is pretty incredible, I would say, especially for something as ubiquitous as oil. Uh, let's see some other. Um, so the dollar, so movements of the dollar can affect inflation. Um, so. Post 2008, there was a lot of talk about how a lot of the programs or the, the fiscal stimulus programs that were being used in most global um, established economies would lead to inflation. Right? You had much more money supply on the, the market, and there was an expectation that that alone would be enough to drive inflation. Well, that didn't pan out. Uh, one of my kind of personal thoughts on that are that, yeah, even though there was a lot of assets or a lot of cash still in the system, um, there was almost like an, an infinite amount of goods to spend it on, right? 
if you wanted to spend your money, if you wanted to buy new cars, if you wanted to buy new stereos, computers, whatever, you didn't have a hard time getting a hold of them. They were, you know, you, uh, pretty easy to order online and show up at your doorstep a few days later. The situation's different now, right? And that the fact that, uh, as Bob mentioned, global supply chains are still in a mess. Um, you, you guys probably have seen news about chip shortages, right? Uh, you can't get cars because they can't get the semiconductors to make all the fancy systems in the cars work. Um, so those, this kind of imbalance between, yeah, we've got a lot of dollars in the system, but there has been a lot of like products and or goods and services available to meet it. Now we've, you know, we're in a situation where we've pumped a lot of money into the system. So you've got this excess supply of money, um, uh, but you don't have the goods uh, there to be able to meet the demand with all that money, right? So that's going to drive up prices. And that's really what we have seen over the last few months. Let me, I'm going to jump ahead. To, yeah, this one here. So this is a uh, solid purple line is inflation kind of based on CPI, uh, the consumer price index. As you can see, significantly higher than, uh, you know, has gone significantly higher this year. Um, and, and I think many sort of pundits and whatnot, this is not unexpected you kind know, of based on the dynamics that we've seen in the global economy. The question now is how long does it last? Um, you know, so the official narrative from the Federal Reserve is that it's transitory, meaning temporary, and as a result of like COVID supply shocks, um, but there are many who think that maybe it's not. Maybe some of these, um, uh, maybe some of these factors are structural and are going to last for a number of years. So that's something that could drive the commodity super cycle, right? Is if we have these sort of structural issues impacting um, the, the the global supply chain, that could drive inflation for a prolonged period of time. Um, as, as you can see kind of on here, the 10-year treasury rate. So that's kind of the interest rate that is going for 10-year U.S. government bonds. So if you, you know, buy a 10-year U.S. treasury bond, you're going to get one and a half percent ish interest payments on that. Um, so, so you're not even close to keeping up with inflation on something like that. If you're interested, if you're a you know, so if you're a retiree and you're living on a fixed income and require, you know, you've got a healthy allocation of bonds and maybe this bottom one here, like dividends from stocks, those yields are down greatly. They are not keeping up with inflation. And that's like kind of the scenario we talked about at the beginning where you're seeing purchasing power eroded, uh, which can be scary if you're, if you're living on a, a fixed income. Um, yeah, so here's just some examples of commodity price moves over the past year or so uh, from the end of September. Um, pretty dramatic in, you know, just about all over the place. Lithium, uh, lithium one that, that gets a lot of news right now because it's pretty critical in the manufacturing of electric vehicles if we want, and just alternative energy in general. So one of the biggest issues right now with alternative energy is how do you store it? If you're using wind, if you're using solar, those are great. The cost per watts have come down quite a bit on those over the last five to 10 years, but we still have an issue of how do we store the energy that we generate if it's not being used immediately? Right now, the best um, technology is lithium batteries. And so you see a lot of increased demand for lithium. Uh, those mines are in pretty... Oh, I don't know how you would classify that controversial parts. I would say, stra I would say strategically uh, testy places. Yeah. As far as our political relationships. So here's an example South of China, America, US. Africa, China. Yeah. China is one of the largest rare earth producers. Mm -hmm. So for us, if we're getting that from China, that's potentially problematic, depending on how relations go. Other countries, South America, uh, other regions where they have that type of mining activity is something that sometimes from a political perspective going to be problematic for us because of lack of relationships or unstable governments that may exist. Now, we have the ability right here in the US 
there have been several substantial rare earth deposits identified, both in the continental US and up in Alaska. Our issue is, of course, our challenges from an environmental standpoint. Yeah, regulatory. Regulatory. We want all these goods and services. We want the changes that we expect to take place. But then how do you get them? You have to mine it. I haven't figured out another way to get it out of the ground or right. create it in another manner. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so the, the dynamics are, uh, you know, as you mentioned, fairly complex. There's no real kind of... Um, there's no real kind of solution that doesn't have like drawbacks as well. Everything's right. got puts and takes. Uh, okay, China exporting inflation, sort of another driver, right? So the last 40 years or so, the global um, sort of manufacturing hub for low quality um, goods and low labor cost goods has been China, um, right? So uh, you're talking clothes, shoes, you name it, cheap toys, you know, historically the last 40 years or so, predominantly that stuff's been manufactured in China. Now that dynamic is changing. Uh, if you sort of pair that with the idea that China's middle class is rising, that means that they're demanding higher wages for their jobs. They don't want to do the low margin manufacturing jobs. They want more value add, um, better wages, higher um, standard of living type stuff. And that means uh, that you're no longer, that's no longer the source that if you wanna make like cheap shirts, you go to China, you've gotta go somewhere else, Vietnam, Bangladesh, somewhere like that. Um, but we're seeing more, uh, making more of an attempt to more high tech manufacturing, computers, medical devices, pharmaceuticals, um, Bob mentioned like the semiconductor industry before China is investing lots and lots of money into building and developing their semiconductor supply chain in-house, right? So that, that's a very complex uh, process, requires billions and billions of dollars of investment. And, um, you, you know, currently the global manufacturing centers for that are Taiwan, where you're getting the sort of leading edge chips, South Korea through like Samsung, same kind of thing, and the US, um, the machines that go into those sort of factories or fabrication uh, facilities to make chips are all um, US and European based companies. Uh, China's um, semiconductor capital equipment industry is still probably two decades behind the rest of the world, right? But they want to be in those high-tech manufacturing. They want to be a high-tech manufacturing hub. There are cities, specific cities in China across several regions that are designed as just like, this is a tech city. We're going to manufacture high-tech stuff here. Um, Tesla's one, right? In the news lately, they have a lot of press for opening up their sort of high-tech factory in China to make the cars there to like sell into China. So those are much higher um, wage jobs than if you're, you know, in a, a toy factory or clothes or some other textiles. Um, we, we talked about commodity prices. Um, this is one that's kind of poignant and, and timely right now. You see, we at multi-year highs. Uh, this is important because in most kind of Western diets, wheat is a, wheat's a staple um, commodity in there, right? So the fact that we're seeing all-time high prices right now, uh, just increased pain in your pocketbook when you go to the grocery store. Um, and, and, and this is a, a point I referenced before with the potential consequences of changing climate and its impact, especially on the more vulnerable yeah. areas. You could see dramatic increases in agricultural products. The vulnerabilities of those populations will be at greater risk. Where will those exports have to come from? If other countries are experiencing, there may be some that make up that differential and that possibility that may not exist is also problematic too. So that adds another one of those stresses that I was describing earlier in terms of where we are that gives the probability of this cycle continuing to increase in terms of higher prices 
inflation and some of the consequences, it would appear that we're in the beginning stages of that type of cycle when you add the totality of the variables that we're discussing right now. I also yeah. want to leave, I just was checking time, Rob. Yeah. We want to leave uh, ample time here for questions and be respectful of people having to go to other places, so. Sure. Uh, yeah, how much time we got left? We're just about 15, 20 minutes away. Oh, okay, so yeah. we want to do yeah. some questions here. So I, I kind of want to talk then just for a sec that the intersection of food and energy, uh, right? Like, the, so the, kind of one of the main uh, things we think about, right? Climate change, as Bob was talking about, as we have more extreme weather, hotter, drier summers, Right, that means less yield in general on stuff like wheat and corn, which are kind of staple uh, food inputs. Uh, but also, uh, I was actually just reading today that a, another kind of unexpected consequence or um, maybe slightly less known on high energy prices is it means less uh, nitrogen for use in um, the fertilizers. So nitrogen is, is kind of um, most commonly derived at, as part of the natural gas refining uh, process because natural gas prices are high right now, nitrogen prices are high. That means there's less available for use in uh, as fertilizer for farming. So if you don't have as much fertilizer, you have less yield, which means you then add, you know, kind of compound the problem even more that that drives up prices as you still have the same demand for wheat and corn, uh, but now your yield is yes, less because you aren't being as efficient in your growing. Um, yeah, we've, I think we've talked quite a bit about sort of this, this uh, Race energy structure. Zero. Yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah. a long-term thing, right? Even if we use less and less oil and petrochemicals for energy, um, it, there's still like it, use is ubiquitous uh, in daily lives, right? It, I know ski season starting to like ramp up here. Everybody's getting their new pants and coats and whatnot. All of that, all your synthetic blend um, textiles, th that all comes from petrochemicals. So you can't avoid it yep. there. Although there is a company that's trying to work on using developing, uh, yep. developing plastics from uh, organic waste rather than petrochemicals, which is pretty interesting. And uh, this is actually a pretty interesting one too when we talk about the kind of energy change. You're talking much more demand for copper, you need more wiring, right? That's sort of a staple in um, batteries, electronics, you know, what, what not if you're trying to get more uh, alternative energy sources. Um, it, it, so the red being here, copper discoveries over the last 30-ish uh, years and orange being like projected, steep drop off over the last decade in discoveries and like projected, just not as much capital flowing to there, or we're just not finding the copper reserves like before. So, you know, supply and demand, there's less supply, the demand is going up, that's driving prices. That could, and this is something that has the, you know, the, ability to be structural mm -hmm. and that it's a, you, you know, a copper mine is not a quick thing to bring online. You're talking multi-year, very complex process of getting approved. Um, it, right now, commodity prices are generally, we're not like at the highest they've ever been. In fact, uh, there's a, a commodity composite index that sort of tracks a basket of 20 or so. We're still below the high of like pre 2008. Well, we're getting back up there pretty quickly. And uh, we talked about kind of like the QE or federal stimulus kind of thing. I think interesting to note, just yesterday, Federal Reserve announced they are going to start um, taking their foot off the gas, the foot's still on the gas, but at a, a less dramatic rate, right? So with the idea being they're going to reduce their purchases of uh, bonds by 15 billion uh, a month over the next two months, and then reevaluate. I think the idea being that they taper back to hey, hey, Rob, I, I, my apologies because this is where I don't want to get into language and discussion that people yeah. are like, "What the heck is he talking about?" Sure. Taper, tape worms, tape this. So yeah. we, I, I, I so want to leave the, for time purposes now to get to some questions here too. 
Sure, 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 yeah. sure, sure, sure. So you want to skip this? Yeah, okay. I, I'm, I guess I'm taking kind of the lead here and saying, let's skip this because I want to be respectful of time. And I'm sure you have a lot of different thoughts and questions about this because this just can get really deep. As I said, it's a mile wide and a mile deep in terms of these yeah. issues. But the bottom line for us is we're heading possibly into a place where you're going to pay in a lot more for all the goods and services that you use. Right. Whether it's at Costco or at the gas pump or your clothing, any number of different items will be more expensive. So let's take some questions at this point, please. So if you have one, you have a nice booming voice, you can stand up or please go to the mic. If nobody has questions, then I'm just going to talk more and more about quantitative easing. Yeah, so what would you rather have? <laughs> talk more or some questions? There you go. Um, I hope I can get us started here. Um, I thought about bringing our brown bag series sort of full circle for the semester and um, talk a little bit about the rare earth mineral um, deposits, as I understand it, in Afghanistan. Mm, mm -hmm. And if China um, now has an inroad there, what kinds of things you think they'll be doing in order to access those deposits? And what are the challenges and the benefits for the world economy? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Bob, you may have some good thoughts on this. I, I will note that uh, as the US was pulling out of, or even pre to the US, officially pulling out of Afghanistan, China was announcing that they were having discussions with the Taliban in, you know, making friends and, uh, you know, sort of stating that they would support them, kind of stuff like that. Uh, I think that you pair that up with this idea of like large rare earth mineral deposits in Afghanistan. And to me, that seems pretty clear. Uh, they're making inroads there. So first, thank you for the question. And you recognize something that is purposeful. We started out the brown bag talking about Afghanistan, but what you're alluding to here is the interconnectedness of what takes place on a daily basis domestically and globally. Events that may happen there that seem distant really do have an effect that may not show up immediately, but in time will. Now, with often the case, saying something but doing it in a cost-effective way that assures that China will make billions of dollars in investment but be able to get that money back out in some capacity may be a very different situation. And often where these discoveries have been made, literally there's no infrastructure. There's no road systems. There's no utilities to provide the electricity for the operations. You have to have a reliable source of water. You have to have a trained labor force. Now, China may be able to provide a lot of capital, but will they be able to provide, based on relationships, the labor force? Where will the electricity come from? So often, as somebody said, we're running out of resources on a global basis. And I had made the point, and I, I, if I'm wrong, I stand corrected, we're not running out of resources. It's the other parts of the equation that become critical to actually be able to extract the resources in an economically feasible fashion. I think there's, and there's less tolerance for um, undisciplined extractive practices. That's a big change that's taken place globally in a lot of extractive industries too. But if we're talking about the Taliban to your question, do you really want them to be your business partner? What is China willing to risk for the instability of potentially what comes with the consequences of being in business with the Taliban? I'm not saying they're gone tomorrow, but uh, that's not a good bet on my part, as opposed to other regions in the world. Yet China realizes, as Russia, the U.S., and other countries, the potentiality of the wealth that that country may contain and what that may mean for the region. Yeah, but you know, China is also, uh, uh, I think, kind of like par for the course. In you know, you're in Central African countries that uh, are not politically stable, mm -hmm. um, you know, where there are rare earth deposits there that they're extracting. South America, you know, Argentina and Chile aren't like the most um, stable of like governments as well. Uh, so I don't know, they, they have experience. Um, they've been burned. Uh, and I'll give you, you mentioned uh, uh, South America, a little country called Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Incredible amount of oil resources that 
tragically for different reasons has wasted a great deal of those resources in terms of what it could be. China made very substantial loans to Venezuela over the last several decades for return of loans for oil. Well, basically they've defaulted on those loans. Not a good bet. How do you go get that money back? Especially if you're not continuing to get oil from them. Do you go in and take over Venezuela? Do you take over the industries? So even being invested in a foreign country for purposes of what you may gain, you're still dealing with somebody that's not in your backyard. So the levels of control can be quite dramatic. I think if you're interested in looking at some of the uh, kind of interesting dynamics there, especially in like South America, check out sort of the, the follies of Elliott Management, which is a big hedge fund here in the US mm -hmm. and their dealings with the Argentine government in trying to, um, trying to get the collateral that's owed to them based on government bonds, pretty, right. pretty right. funny stuff. Yeah. Any other questions? So, so let me ask, I'll pose a question to you and to our audience on uh, Zoom. I realize we threw an awful lot of different variables. What stood out? Is there a specific area that we discussed that stood out to you that triggered something in terms of interest or concern? Because inflation right now is affecting every one of us. Food prices are up. Gas pumps are the most obvious. But if we look at this from a geopolitical standpoint as well, our relationships, not just with China, but with other countries, other regions. Nothing. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yep. Great question. Did, did everybody hear the question? So, so just to kind of restate, yeah. it, is it possible or how is there a way to put pressure on China and Russia to cooperate with some of the kind of global um, initiatives when it comes to energy, you know, if, if they're not going to show up to things like the, the, the Glasgow conference right. right now? Well, I, I think it's very challenging. Um, and very interesting because if you, if you think about the U.S. over the previous administration didn't participate in some of these sorts mm -hmm. of discussions, right? There's, it's very hard uh, to, to do, right? I mean, because if you think, you know, uh, sort of back to what Bob was talking about originally, um, you know, the industrialized West has a, a certain standard of living that we've all become accustomed to. And it was a result of, you know, the last 140, 50 years of industrialization. And now China and Russia are wanting to catch up and have those same kind of things. So it's, been, it's very hard to say like, you know, put restrictions in place on their, you know, China specifically, that's a very large amount of people I, I would think you have a tenuous control in the country in general uh, of making sure that everybody's comfortable. So yeah, I, yeah, I don't know if there are many great levers. You can try to do trade kind of stuff, but you've got trade agreements. Yeah, the, the, those got, are like double-edged swords. Right. Though, because... Yeah, you've got trade organizations, WTO, IMF. You have treaties. You have relationships with countries, but the issue always has and will continue to be the self-interest of individual countries. We need to cooperate and work together on big problems and issues at the end of the day. I have looked at this and I'm always challenged by how do you get promises made but not kept? An example is the Paris Agreements on Climate Change. Countries pledged significant amounts of money. Not a great deal of that money has actually been put towards the agreements that were made. So what's the enforcement mechanism? How do you put in place an enforcement mechanism that actually has some teeth? This is ongoing. So question, thank you. Yeah.
Thanks a lot, Bob. I'm sorry I came late. And so if I've-, I've uh, This is uh, the system. director for the Montana World Affairs Council, Chris Heaslip. And Chris, yep, thanks thank a you. Lot for that. I was gonna make a comment, but Bob, not surprisingly, beat me to the punch. I, I guess the, the comment on this question would be just to look at American foreign policy. The post-war period shows you know, a great uh, um, ability to form coalitions, to form relationships, be they economic, social, cultural, or otherwise diplomatic. And it's through that when you look at outliers who currently might be China and Russia, 10 years from now, it'll be a different group or mm -hmm. a different, uh, right. the, the answer, at least from uh, our history and our own policy shows that the ability to, to create these, um, these cooperative groups, whatever they may be, actually holds a great key in being able to deal with outliers, you know, like right now. So that was a, a very good point. Um, I do have a question though, Bob, just picking up on, on your very last point in the presentation where you said we need to expect to pay more in the immediate term. Yeah. Um, if we put our faith in the, in the free markets and, and the competition of free markets, we would assume that then we're gonna start paying less after a while because the market is going to kick in and going to find ways in which to deliver goods to market at a lower price to beat the competition. Will we, act, will we be seeing that? And if so, what factors kick in to allow that to take place? I'm gonna let uh, uh, Rob give his input here, but I, I'm just chuckling to myself because I literally was on a phone call with a friend of mine who called and was asking exactly that question. And my response is, while it's gonna be a bit messy for a while, I wanna see the markets become the solution to what you're describing here, Chris, and not a regulatory component coming from the feds. Cause I don't, I'm not sure that they have an answer. What they can do to help is maybe start to mitigate some of the regulations that are in place, like truckers, as an example, or some of the, or some of the regulations that make it more difficult to kind of reconstitute. But I believe right now the market is actively seeking for its own profit and ability to, to deliver goods and services, the very solutions that we are going to need, whether it's a FedEx or a Lowe's or a Costco or any number of entities that has to come up with ways to work around the temporary bottlenecks that we're seeing. Yeah, I, um, I think there's a great adage when it comes to commodities and this kind of pricing, right? That the cure for high prices is high prices. And that's kind of what you're alluding to. Especially when, if you, you know, if there's an opportunity for an outsized profit return in the market, typically, uh, if the incentives are right, you get capital flowing to that to sort of get that return. So I would expect that to happen. How long it takes is another question. Um, I, I think as well, when we talk about like this sort of inflation right now, there are certainly some, some parts of it that I think are transitory or in temporary. Um, you know, the, the, you guys have kept up on used car pricing. Uh, I think that's nuts, right? Like, I don't know if we'll ever, I don't know if we'll ever see in a, a time again in our lives where you can sell a, a car that you bought used three years ago for more than you, you know, bought it for. That, that just like never happens. That'll adjust. Will the container ships at the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach get sorted out? Yeah, eventually. It may take a while. Is there enough investment going into developing copper mines? Well, I don't know. And that's a much yeah. uh, longer term problem. And the solution is, is longer to like bring online as well. So I think you're going to see pockets where you're going to have, um, yeah, prices are going to be high in certain things for a while. Housing is another great one, right? Like a, um, do can house prices continue to grow at the clip that they've been growing at the last years? No. Does that mean they go down? Oh, I don't think so either, right? Maybe we get a stall, something. Changes in interest rates could certainly do that, right? If, if uh, I think I just saw yesterday, expectations are now that the Fed raises short-term interest rates, three hikes next year. Uh, that's sort of what the market is pricing in. Um, if that impacts longer term rates somehow, certainly could see a slowdown in, in that market if mortgages go from 3% to 5 um, So, yeah, it's complicated. Dr. Kia? Thank you very much, Chris, for your excellent presentation. Um, if I can see both of your presentations to a specific question, uh, you have a demographic issue 
Exactly. I always love your questions because literally what it leads to is the first brown bag we'll do in January because it's substantial, it's thoughtful, and everyone sitting here will have their own thoughts and views about these conflicts. Yeah, I, I have this interesting kind of inverse concept that greater wealth creation actually is a solution to solving many of the problems. Well, how can that be? More consumption more demands for goods and services, more extraction industries. When you are a country that is trying to feed its people and you're being, and you're being affected by variables internally and externally, whether it's water, the most important resource, the impact of climate change, Afghanistan right now is suffering through a drought in the northern part of the country, which is lending itself to agricultural issues. You've got to feed your people. You've got to provide some basic goods and services and stability, you have to have representative government and you have to have infrastructure. Without that, all these wonderful wants and needs and this brave new world that we're working towards may still happen, but it's going to be messy. And to Dr. Kia's point, when he shut down the Keystone Pipeline, that may not have had a massive or significant impact in terms of the flow of oil, but it sends a signal to the marketplace about what may be happening and the changes that are gonna be wrought. So when you also then reduce the availability of federal land for oil or gas exploration, it ties right into the point that Rob was making earlier in terms of, gosh, we have all this oil and gas, prices were going up, investment was massive. And now we're seeing these companies get, one, they may have been over leveraged. Number two, they're getting very skittish about making additional investments. Yep because of the signals that are coming from the state side of the equation. So it does have a real impact. And then the point that's always been made, do you want to be relatively self-sufficient or do you want to get extractive industries from countries that do not have the environmental standards, do not have the political stability, and can use that as weapons for instability in the regions of which they exist? And this is where the political debate gets really messy. I think so it's, I'm going to get off my high horse here. No, I, I, yeah. I agree. I mean, I think it's a really interesting strategy. Say what you want about trying to incentivize more alternative energy investment and, and things like that. But when you disincentivize uh, energy investment in the in this country, and then ask OPEC to like please produce more, <laughs> I don't know. That's a bold strategy. I'm not right. sure it's going to work out. Well, and, and just call me crazy. Efficiency in terms of where we were 30 years ago has increased dramatically. We are more energy efficient in terms of we're using about the same amount of energy 
but we have grown in terms of our GDP yeah. substantially. So what does that say? Did oil become on its own just more energy efficient or did our technology and innovation lend itself to becoming more energy efficient? I think it's the latter, not the former. Yeah, and I, I think as well as if you're concerned, uh, you know, if you're concerned about the climate impact of extractive, you know, I would rather have that going on in a place like the United States that has pretty established environmental protections yeah. and policies than Saudi Arabia or Russia or Venezuela or, you know, other places that Venezuela can't even concerned. feed its own people right now. Yeah. And that is all the oil in the world. Yeah. So uh, I, this is where my, my brain has got to stop because we're just kind of getting started here, but I have to be respectful of everybody's time, but we will look at what we've done here in this first semester of brown bag presentations. And with Dr. Kia's help and advice, consider what will be of interest going forward. We're just getting started in stringing together the types of programs in education that are very important to what we're having to deal with today. I hope you've all enjoyed this. We'll stay around for a few minutes if you do have additional questions. And I wanna thank everybody that turned out today. So look, have a great Thanksgiving, wonderful holidays. We'll see you back here in January.